with every passing year. I think at this point it's probably too long to uh, to even list those challenges in the in the short uh, introduction. Um, so we are going to discuss some of those challenges uh, today. Uh, we have four panels uh, um, at the summit. The first two will take place here at the Center for European Studies, and then uh, lunch and uh, the other two panels will be uh, at the uh, faculty club. Um, Every year we partner with some other institutions in preparing the summit. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to, uh, uh, to say that uh, this year we partner with Diane Neosis, uh, Independent Research and Policy Institute in Athens and with the uh, Wissenschaftszentrum uh, Berlin. Uh, so my thanks to uh, um, uh, Neosis people and, uh, and to Jutta Linger, who is sitting next to me. Um, uh, before I uh, ask uh, Mr. Theodoris Gariakopoulos to say a few words, um, I would like to thank um, our executive director, Elaine Papoulias, and the entire staff of the Center for European Studies for all their hard work on that summit. So thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Where is our friend from? I'm here. Oh, yes. Sorry. Very close. <laughs> Sorry, thank you so much. Good morning, and thank you for having us here. Uh, I would like, of course, to thank Gregor and especially Elaine, uh, who is a member of our advisory board, um, as well as Yuta, who is co-sponsoring co the event. We are from the Aneosis. We are an, a non-profit think tank from Greece. Uh, we publish studies on economic and social issues that concern Greece, present policy recommendations to the government and political parties. Um, we make our findings accessible and easy to understand for the Greek public. And we've published 18 studies so far in the short period that we've been active um, on issues like tax evasion, uh, the impact of climate change on the Greek economy, uh, the demographic crisis, the problem of absolute poverty. And we have a series of project and in projects and initiatives about the European Union and Greece's participation in it. And uh, we have several books lined up, and this is uh, the beginning of uh, these initiatives, the, our participation in this uh, conference right here. Now, we are primarily focused on Greece. Um, Greece is a small European country. One would argue that it's not representative of what the European Union is. However, it's an unusual country, and, in, and one of that, that has some things to teach other countries, for instance, Historically, we've been ahead of the curve on several issues. For example, we abolished slavery in 1822 during our inception as a country, which in international terms is quite early. We got into the European Union way years before Spain, uh, Sweden, or Austria. And even today in the age of populism and fake news, well, we've been ahead of the curve in several issues as well. Um, the trend of the poorly thought out referendum one with horrible consequences, we pioneered that. Uh, several European countries have had massive bailouts uh, to save their economies. We were first there as well. And we're also the last remaining uh, country under bailout sanctions. Um, what I'm trying to say is that um, if you get a sense of what happens in Greece, you may get a better sense of what is going to happen to other countries as well. Uh, around the European Union. We, um, the United States has Nazis now. We've had the extreme far right in our parliament for several years. Uh, we're a small country, but seem to be some sort of testing tube for everything new that happens in uh, the world, uh, or some sort of a canary in the coal mine, so to speak. So knowing about what happens in Greece may help you understand better what happens in the rest of the European Union. This is where we come in. We'll, you'll be hearing about uh, what our findings um, from Greece later on. And um, we're very proud to co-host this conference, to co-sponsor it. And we're looking forward to lively discussions and meaningful insights on a very, very important subject. Thank you very much. Um, we have amazing lineup of speakers uh, uh, for the summit, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our first panel. 
um, uh, we have uh, uh, four uh, very distinguished uh, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, and I will very briefly uh, introduce them. So Jutta Almendinger is the president of the uh, Wissenschaft Zentrum Berlin. Uh, this is the most important social science research uh, institute in Germany. Uh, she's also a professor of educational sociology and labor market research at Humboldt. Uh, University. Uh, Utah is also a senior fellow uh, at the Center for European Studies. Um, her PhD is from Harvard. Uh, we are very proud of that. And um, and prior to Wetzebe, uh, she was professor of sociology at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich and director of the Institute of Employment Research in Nuremberg. Um, Jonathan, Jonathan Cole uh, is a John Mitchell Mason professor of Columbia University for 14 years from 89 to 2003. Uh, Professor Cole was the provost and the dean of faculties uh, at Columbia. Uh, his PhD is also from Columbia. Uh, he works on issues connected to higher education and especially on the role of great American research universities. He's also uh, a member of the board of trustees of the Central European University in Budapest. Uh, which was one of the most important uh, issues uh, uh, which we consider for, uh, for this uh, summit. Um, Ersin Kalaicho Olu uh, is the professor of political science at Sabanji University. Uh, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Uh, before moving to Sabanji, he served as the president of Ishik uh, University. Uh, he's a political sociologist, political scientist. He specializes in comparative politics and works mostly on Turkey. Um, and Louis Richardson assumed the position of the vice chancellor of Oxford University in January 2016. Uh, before that, she was principal and vice chancellor of the University of St. Andrew in Scotland. Um, and before that, uh, she was professor uh, um, of political science of government uh, at Harvard for many years and the executive dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, she's also the senior fellow uh, at the Center for European Studies. Uh, 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 Louise Richardson's work is mostly on security issues, international terrorism, uh, British and foreign defense policy and international relations. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this uh, a very important initial panel of, uh, of our summit, which will deal with the academic liberties, uh, with uh, assaults on uh, freedom of uh, media and, um, and uh, all the new difficult times connected to fake news and uh, ambitions of very powerful rulers to restrict uh, uh, the freedom of academia. Uh, so um, we will proceed with an actually Figure that out. Who will start first? Uh, okay. A, you know. All right. So the floor is yours. Visa first, and uh, let me start. Thank you, uh, Craig, uh, in particular, and also uh, Kyriakos and Theodorus, uh, uh, because the WCB, the Social Science Center in Berlin, really hosts a lot of conventions, of discussion rounds, and I usually have to work a lot on this. In this particular uh, thing, I didn't work at all. Uh, so thanks, Elaine, for putting this wonderful program together and inviting all those wonderful people. I'm grateful, and I have to tell you that I always come here because it makes my life much easier. So uh, thanks, <laughs> really. Uh, and um, of course, I mean, as you can imagine, um, being here on a panel with not just distinguished professors, but also with people coming from countries where life in academia uh, is much worse and uh, where academic freedom is much more under pressure. This makes me very humble uh, because in Germany things still look uh, very different, I have to say. Germany, unlike the US, uh, the UK, Turkey, Hungary and other countries is still in a very privileged situation. Science, um, and I'm also including the social sciences, is well off. The vast majority of our political parties and politicians do not really mistrust sciences, and they do not shield themselves from scientific knowledge. The rise of the new party called Alternative for Germany, and you all have heard about it, is to be taken very seriously indeed, 
But compared to other countries, this populist party did not yet reach in the inner core of, uh, of political decision making, and it did not reach to the inner core of uh, academic freedom, I have to say this, and I'll come back later to that. As for finances, and you know that this has been a huge threat for the sciences in other countries, uh, the situation in Germany is very well indeed. We have a constant in decrease uh, in uh, expenditure for education and sciences. We are not at the very top of Europe. And even if you look at the program of this new coalition, which tries to find each other, a retrenchment is, is not at all in sight. I mean, I'm, I'm not concerned about this. And just looking at my own institution, which is primarily focusing on the social sciences, we have more and more opportunities for third party money and not the other way around. Or to put it in other ways, uh, we usually have, we have a budget of overall 20 million. In addition to this, we have five or six million from outside money this year we have close to 16 million. This shows the ample opportunities for the social sciences uh, in terms of third party money. So uh, I can't say that uh, this is something, you know, compared to uh, what you envision. <laughs> this, uh, however, does not mean that everything is well. There are a couple of very serious threats to academic freedom in Germany. And uh, those threats are not coming uh, from outside only, but they are primarily, and this is what I want to focus on, because I know that the other panel members will uh, have a stance from threats coming from outside to academic freedom. So I focus to threats and on threats from uh, pressures coming from with inside, or you know, developments which uh, I cannot really approve. The first one is um, that if you read papers, and a lot uh, has been published on academic freedom in Germany, they all meet in one strong suggestion. And this suggestion is that scientists themselves have to speak up and need to transfer the knowledge to the wider public. There is no commentator in Germany who doesn't make this point, not in the media, not from within uh, sciences. They all say, well, you have to stand up and uh, take care of yourself. On the other hand, only a few scientists indeed uh, do that. Uh, and uh, I think uh, they have a lot of good reasons not engaging in public discourse. Within uh, academic uh, media, um, exposure is still uh, very contested. And it is regarded entirely unprofessional if an academic exposes him or herself too much to the media. We follow in Germany an either or logic, so either academic or public intellectual. I'm heading academic institutions no more than 15 years, and all of them have 500 plus people. So I'm really talking about huge organizations in Germany. Throughout and over the years, and not stopping right now, I'm getting asked whether I strive those organizations to go for academic or for public impact. Whether I want to head organizations towards more peer-reviewed journals or for opinion pages in the media. At least in Germany, we are not used at all to think in terms of academic and media impact, probably with the exception of uh, economics. In turn, we do not have any reward system for young scholars for exposing themselves and getting involved with the broader public. All rewards go to scholarly papers, a few to teaching. Blaming academics for not exposing themselves to the public means actually uh, to blame ourselves for not changing the reward system. Combating popular movements asks for changing the rules of the academic game. And I mean this very seriously. Of course, we also have scientists talking to the wider public. They are they're mostly older and uh, can afford this because they are in secure positions. And often their messages remain unheard. In part, this is because we ask people to come to us and 
this institute, our doors are wide open. So whoever wants to visit the Social Science uh, Research Institute in Berlin, please come and see. I mean, what we are really expecting is that people coming to this bold, old, wonderful building. I don't think that this is the way to go. We have to bring science to the people, and we do this in a couple of initiatives, and they are highly successful. In part, we remain unheard because we use a language which is simply unsuited uh, to the audience. In part, um, I also think uh, that uh, we are arrogant, to put it uh, hard, or ignorant, addressing the public with a certain disrespect. And uh, I just want to give you one example of an outreach in Germany, uh, which I have attended shortly before I left to the States. A scientist, and uh, the audience was crowded with people, talked about poverty and how poverty is measured, and that everyone under 60% of the median income is supposed to be poor. And then a woman uh, got up saying, well, I'm not poor. Uh, I earn not enough money, but, but I'm not poor. And the scientist staying here and said, of course you are poor. You are statistically poor. And this uh, woman looked at it, and then others in the audience said, well, I'm poor, but according to your measures, I'm rich. Uh, and uh, this person wasn't able to take this audience seriously, uh, to, to ask, you know, so what's really going to show interest, to show respect, to ask, so what is going on to investigate why we have this misfit of statistical measures and personally fault measures. And he went so far saying, well, I mean, this is sort of fake. You make something up. And this is, of course, not the way how we transport uh, our results. And uh, this, I think, is, is an arrogance we, we have to, uh, <laughs> to, to do abolish. I mean, this is not how we think that we, uh, or as I think, that we can communicate uh, with the public. <laughs> so uh, I think that combating populist, populist movements means to bring science to the people in ways they understand and in ways they can connect to it. It also means showing interest in the people and takes them very seriously. I have to admit that this is not very easy. And I give you another example from myself. I was asked by the Zeit, and this is a very prestigious uh, weekly journal with a very active online portal, to write five opinion <coughs> page, uh, pieces uh, just before the election. And I did this, and uh, it prompted more than 200,000 comments. And I thought, well, <clears throat> so what I, what I do? Uh, and I asked a research assistant uh, investigating what those people write, and they told me, well, see, they're mostly very serious. So they take your arguments and argue with you. But I didn't have the time. I mean, I let those people write comments over comments, uh, and then I was listed, well, mostly write uh, journal uh, paper, uh, but, you know, I didn't do anything. So we left those communicators inside their own ream of, communicate, uh, of uh, commenters talking to commenters, which is not the right way, I think, but uh, I hardly have, I really have problems thinking about alternatives, how I can handle uh, such situations, and I'm most certainly not the only person who had this experience. My third point on internal pressures is also a threat to academic freedom from within. All of us working and learning in academia should stay with the rules of academic freedom, and they all should cherish them. This is not always the case. Let me give you one recent example from the social sciences. And uh, this is a case of Ruth Koopmans. And Ruth Koopmans is a member of the social science uh, research team. Uh, he is an expert, an international expert on migration and integration. He is internationally very renowned. So uh, he did a huge study, and at the end of the study, he found out uh, that uh, people with a Muslim background uh, do not subscribe German values to the extent that people with another religious background do. And he wrote it up. He showed his methods, his historical background. And what happened is students contested those results rigorously. So they wrote blogs accusing him. They had 
even a squattering of the university building, so the teaching had to stop for more than three months, actually. And the problem was um, that they did not want to engage in a personal conversation with Ruth Kochmanns, though she just blocked it. So he offered communication, he offered lectures, he offered uh, discussions, and they didn't, they didn't agree on doing <coughs> so. And although they had, I think, a number of very good points, because the databases was weak, there were huge problems of causality uh, in Ruth Kochmanns' work, but it even didn't get to the point of joint discourse. And the university administration, it took them more than four weeks to react, to defend academic uh, freedom. So this is a huge problem. So I was highly sympathetic <coughs> with the students' points. I was highly sympathetic with the value system. But we are not talking about values here. We are talking about epic academic knowledge. We are talking about falsification. And therefore, all of, all of us have to be open for falsification, of course. So uh, far, uh, I gave you examples, and uh, those are only three of many more I could make uh, for pressures which come from inside. Um, but of course, uh, we have a lot of pressures coming uh, from outside as well. And the first uh, is, of course, that uh, academia is international. What happens in Hungary, what happens in Turkey, the UK, and what happens in the US is happening to Germans as well. I mean, no doubt about this. I cannot think about uh, academe with it nation, national. We will lose colleagues, collaborators. We will lose the international discourse. And for this reason, uh, many scholars in Germany and in other countries stood up and participated uh, in the March of Sciences in April uh, this year. Second, uh, although the new party alternative for Germany is comparative low in numbers comparatively to others, not compared to German history, uh, the members are heard and are all present, uh, and, and their members are heard and all present all over. Um, as I said before, uh, in the moment they not yet distrust science uh, as we see it in other countries, but they deny at least some people of this party, not the party overall, denies climate change as we know it from other countries. Uh, they deny major findings of gender studies in particular. They deny human rights to refugees and distort most empirical findings about migration and integration. So they are not at all able to question their value system. They wish to stick with this regardless of what science says and they shield themselves from falsification. We all have to combat this threat to the very core of what constitutes academic freedom. We can do so by starting by ourselves and with ourselves. And this is, I think, the big thing I wanted to make clear today. I think that in Germany, at least, we always sort of have this impression that this is outside and there's not much we can do. And on the opposite, uh, I say, and I make this point repeatedly, that we have to start with ourselves in educating our students and giving them the freedom and also then uh, the reward system for getting engaged and not saying, well, foy. This is not science anymore. So thank you very much for your attention. OK, it's good to be here this morning and to discuss this topic, which is dear to my heart. Authoritarian regimes are on the rise in Europe. Anti-intellectualism is resurfacing, and many major universities are either being purged of some of its faculty members with critical voices, or the entire university's very existence is being threatened. Of course, political regimes tend to be of short duration, like people, while the lives of great universities, like Harvard and Oxford, are longer, like art. But we should also recognize that some excellent but fragile institutions could be destroyed by government suppression of ideas and research. Great destruction can be accomplished, as we know, in a short period of time. Are we entering one of those periods? 
This exercise of power and repression is becoming increasingly visible in Hungary, Poland, Russia, Turkey, Czech Republic, China, and elsewhere, and some of the nations that have been mentioned previously. In these so-called illiberal democracies, the government will withdraw basic civil liberties from its citizens, often in the name of stability and economic gain, such as freedom of expression, freedom of the press, privacy rights, the right to petition the government, protection of minorities, and the freedom to criticize their policies. It will close its borders to foreigners. It will use fear as a political instrument. And if individuals in certain positions, including university positions, do not fall into line behind those in power, they are purged from their jobs or silenced out of fear of the prospect of losing their position or worse. This is the movement towards authoritarian rule. Let me count just a few of the ways that illiberal democracies, a truly Orwellian term, are undermining academic freedom and are a legitimate threat to some fine institutions. In 2016 and 17, according to scholars at risk, and in the interest of full disclosure, I'm a member of the SAR board of trustees, over 1,400 scholars, staff, and students in Turkey were detained, arrested, or named in warrants. More than 60,000 students there were affected by state-ordered university closings. 407 higher education personnel and students were criminally charged, and over 7,000 higher education personnel were dismissed and banned from bu public service and travel abroad. Very good example of one of these cases is uh, made by uh, Danny Roderick, of your, one of your own, in a recent op-ed piece. In Pakistan, an individual, a journalism student in the northern city of Marden, was brutally attacked and killed by a mob after being accused of blasphemy which amounted to his maintaining a Facebook page that raised issues related to student rights. Others in Pakistan have been kidnapped and some tortured for their social media posts. In Hungary, the regime of Prime Minister Viktor Orban passed legislation without debate, now referred to as Lex CEU, that would effectively close the Central European University, which educates roughly 1,700 students from over 120 countries, draws faculty from all over the world, and is dedicated to open society principles espoused by Karl Popper, among others. Born in Hungary, the university's founder, George Soros, escaped just before the Nazis invaded Hungary, studied with Popper at the LSE, and who, after making a fortune outside of philosophy, because Popper said he wouldn't be a very good philosopher, endowed CEU, a graduate university in the social and behavioral sciences, with over $700 million some 25 years ago. Orban, perhaps the originator of the term illiberal democracy, controls the Hungarian legislature, the media, and the courts, so passing legislation to his liking was hardly difficult. The vendetta against CEU, whose board I'm on, may be as much a personal one against Soros and his NGOs as against the university itself. But recent developments within the past two weeks suggest that the animus of Orban towards Soros, which has led him to initiate a criminal investigation of Soros, goes beyond the personal. In fact, just last week, Orban took to radio to denounce Soros and his followers, saying, I quote, by employing the National Security Service, the Soros network that strives to influence European life should be exposed. Another question is, who are these Hungarians who are participating in this process from here, within Hungary, unquote. One indicator that the attack includes uh, the liberal ideals of CEU is that its current, uh, there are, uh, the current attacks on Michael Ignatieff, also lately of Harvard, uh, who is now the CEU's uh, rector and president over the past nine months and has been a staunch defender of academic freedom at CEU and argues that the attack on CEU is in fact an attack on academic freedom. Now the turn to populism is highly visible today in parts of Europe. While perhaps not the focus of this particular summit, similar repressive moves against university faculty and students can be found in Latin America, in nations like uh, Venezuela. And uh, we should not delude ourselves that it's uh, not going on here in the United States as well at the state and federal level. 
Academic freedom and free inquiry are at the very core of the value systems of our great universities. I will assert what I believe to be a fact and not a false fact. You cannot find and have a truly distinguished, preeminent research university without a deep commitment to an institutionalization of academic freedom and free inquiry. Indeed, I have argued elsewhere that academic freedom is truly an enabling, um, it's an enabling value because it enables other values, such as meritocracy or the open communication of ideas, to take shape at universities and at least potentially operate as an aspirational system on which greatness can be built. But why are these values antithetical to the operation of the illiberal state? After all, these nations hold ostensibly open and free elections. But the central authorities also tightly control the executive and legislative branches of government, operations of the courts, and the content and distribution of news, as I said. For one, it's in the very nature of great universities that they should be oppositional. Consider just a couple of statements about the character of the opposition, as well as the functions of great universities. As a preliminary quote, I want to refer to Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' famous dissent in the 1919 Abrams case, which provides some uh, intellectual context for repression that we're seeing today. He said, persecution for the expression of opinion seems to me perfectly logical. If you have no doubt of your premises or your power and want a certain result with all your heart, you naturally expre express your wishes in law and sweep away all opposition. To allow opposition by speech seems to indicate that you think speech impotent. Of course, Holmes was speaking about free expression in general. Increasingly, we are observing governments that seem not to believe that the rule of law and the ideas expressed freely at great universities may yield something more and different than what they believe with all their power to be right. When that happens, academic freedom and free inquiry are in peril. That is what seems to be happening in many societies today. The political correlates of the repression in the authoritarian fashion of academic freedom and free expression were well expressed in a recent SAR conference by the president of Ireland, Michael Higgins, um, echoing almost 100 years later the words of Justice Holmes. He said, Ideas, the free discussion of ideas, the critique and questioning of received ideas and the articulation of new ones are activities that are fundamental to the shaping of public discourse and to the vitality of democratic life. The repression of these core va liberal values is antithetical to the very nature of the university which attempts to create an open free spa space where individuals can contest conventional wisdom, wisdom orthodoxies, and existing ideas. Max Weber, in his still relevant essay, Sciences of Vocation, said, the primary task of a useful teacher is to teach his students to recognize inconvenient facts. The essence of humanistic studies, as expressed by literary critics from Lionel Trilling to Edward Said, is to be oppositional, to discuss and question traditional values, not necessarily to overthrow them, but to elevate the basis on which they are embraced or altered. It is to follow the argument and ev evidence where it leads. The stance is the posture taken by brilliant scientists and scholars. What we might call this University of Chicago principles is found in 1967 Calvin Committee report and the more recent 2016 Stone Committee report. The Calvin Committee, looking at the role of universities in perilous times, staked out the position of the university as follows, I quote, a university faithful to its mission will provide enduring challenges to social values, policies, practices, and institutions. By design and by effect, it is the institution which creates discontent with the existing social arrangements and proposes new ones. In brief, a good university like Socrates will be upsetting. To bring this up to date, the Stone Committee report reinforced the earlier view. It said, the university's fundamental commitment 
is to the principle that debate or deliberation may not be suppressed because the ideas put forth are thought by some or even by most of the university community to be offensive, unwise, immoral, or wrongheaded. Indeed, fostering the ability of members of the university community to engage in such debate and deliberation in an effective and re responsible manner is an essential part of the university's educational mission. Authoritarian regimes don't like this kind of talk and often act to suppress it. It threatens their power. So perhaps the state of academic freedom and free inquiry is one reasonable indicator of the liberal or illiberal state. The repression of free expression and inquiry is abundantly apparent in the cases <clears throat> that I referred to a few minutes ago. But it also, makes a, it also takes a variety of forms. And it is important to note that while the focus of this summit is on nations other than our own, there is a significant apprehension in American universities about the repression of free speech and free inquiry. When we talk about academic freedom, we too rarely discuss the political effects to suppress research. Yet authoritarian states and those moving in that direction, especially in this new moment of populism, are also committed to suppress research that it finds opprobrious to its ideological bent. If we think for a moment about the compact between American universities and the federal government as an illustration for what might exist elsewhere, we can't help but be impressed by what the exchange embraces. For producing a better educated citizenry and for developing new knowledge that has both an intrinsic value, think gravitational waves, or at the point of its discovery, the laser, or research that will improve the quality of our lives, we are asking the government to finance university research and, uh, and fin other, offer financial aid for our students, but to keep its hands off the university and how it operates, to grant it autonomy and allow it to police itself. In short, don't tread on our academic freedom or our efforts to provide a space for free inquiry. While we're attempting to deliver something that is rare and essential for democracy, it is also all too often viewed as a threat to the existing order. We might ask, when does trust in the bargain that has been struck break down and why? And what are the consequences for the nation and the university to discard the compact's essential elements? Now, before concluding with a few words about what might be done to combat this new wave of populism and autocratic rule, I want to suggest that we begin to think of violations of academic freedom and free inquiry as a multidimensional space. Not all violations can be categorized similarly. What has happened in Turkey and other nations where people's lives are literally at stake, where students and faculty are arrested, incarcerated, and sometimes tortured, where students have their universities become the object of political purges, is quite different from the troubling situation that we face at the Central European University. We need to create a typology of attacks on academic freedom in our times. These very types of attacks may have very different causes and consequences, and we should not be responding to them in a cookie cutter fashion. Moreover, the typology relevant for today's relationships between universities and nation states may well be quite different from past attempts to suppress academic freedom at universities. I have not seen such a typology, but we need to construct a useful one. <coughs> Finally, Without dealing with the causes of the new populist movements in Europe, from problems of migration, xenophobia, and false facts that produce much of the public fear and fuel these movements, consider a few ways that we sh uh, should try to respond to the attacks on our universities. Let me speak first again about the case of CEU, since it's the one I know the best. The leadership of CEU and its board members has been actively engaged in defending CEU from Orban's attacks and has made efforts to change the legislation that would close it. As an attack on the autonomy and act academic freedom of the university, two board members, Gerhard Casper, the former president of Stanford, and myself were given the assignment of writing a petition against the legislation that would be signed by leaders of the top universities in the world. This had to be done quickly 
Besides trying to herd a very busy set of cats, we were remarkably successful at obtaining the signatures of the leaders of perhaps 30 of the world's 40 most prestigious universities and had individual letters sent by others. Louise Richardson, Vice Chancellor of Oxford, um, was one of those people who I believe sent an, a letter independently, and I'm glad to see her today. She's also a member of the board at CEU. Candidly, these letters had essentially no discernible impact on Mr. Orban, as far as anyone can tell. It ironically helped the visibility of CEU. We're much better known today than ever before. But it did not seem to move Orban. Leading Hungarian scholars and prominent members of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences tried to persuade the Hungarian leadership of the inappropriateness of Lex CEU legislation. Over 70,000 protesters marched in Budapest attacking the legislation, a demonstration, I might add, that was neither initiated nor fostered by the CEU leadership. Efforts were made within the European Union and its court to sanction Hungary. That did elicit some response, as did a strong negative response that was unexpected by the US State Department and the governor of the state of New York, where CEU is actually chartered. Negotiations began between representatives of the Hungarian government and those of CEU and the state of New York. A draft agreement was reached. It was sent to Orban, where it continues to sit on his desk, waiting for him to move it to the Hungarian parliament. But no economic sanctions were threatened, and all these actions appear to have had little effect. Meanwhile, uncertainty grows within the university community, and there is a sense that the tactic of death by a thousand cuts or prolonged bleeding could lead to the annihilation of CEU in Budapest. So what is to be done? The autonomy of the university is such importance that the general legislation and regulations governing higher education in Europe should not only guarantee the free movement and, of students and faculty, as it does, and supports academic freedom and free inquiry, which it does. It must go further to include sanctions for those nations that depend on the EU for financial support. Those sanctions are apt to have a greater effect than all of the protests that we can muster from within the academic community. The closing down of universities, which has now happened in non-member states, such as Russia and Turkey, must be dealt with through meaningful sanctions that have an effect on the economy of the nations that undermine the autonomy of the university. The nature of these sanctions and which of them will be appropriate for different types of transgressions needs to be developed. We in the academic community must remain vigilant in defending our core values and learn to explain better to the public, as was noted, why they are so important and what are the consequences for the citizens of all nations. Let's not sugarcoat this. Academic leaders, with few notable exceptions, have not been articulate defenders of these values and have not learned how to reach a wider audience to express why those values are important for the public good. Recent data suggest that there may have been erosion on university campuses and the faculty's commitment to academic freedom and free expression. Many faculty members and students now believe that other values are of equal importance. The argument must be made by courageous and prominent educational leaders including faculty, for why the commitment to academic freedom and true free expression, such as those expressed in the Chicago principles, remain at the essential core of great institutions of higher learning. While it may prove difficult to fight populism in the age of false facts, where government leaders seem to live by the big lie theory, in a post-truth world of authoritarian nations, there should be efforts to call out those regimes elsewhere so that people throughout Europe, for example, know exactly what is in fact going on in places like Hungary. We should become experts, or we should get experts, to tell the truth through social media campaigns which have no international borders. We should urge businesses to reduce their investments in nations with authoritarian governments. We should suggest that people stop traveling to those illiberal democracies until some semblance of civil society has been restored. Finally, let me make clear about a matter of causation. It is always difficult to find the causes of widespread and complex social phenomena, such as the proliferation of autocratic regimes and the spread of so-called false facts. 
Academic freedom is not, I believe, one of the root causes of this phenomena. The attack on it is one of the main debili main, many debilitating consequences of the growth and spread of these forms of governance. Among the causes that one ought to look to, at least for a partial explanation, are the stagnation of income among many of the less well-educated in those countries, the despair about the apparent inability of democratic regimes to improve a significant portion of the population's life chances, the fear associated with terrorist acts of violence, regardless of the actual very low probability that terrorism will affect individuals or their families, the substantial growth of inequality of income and wealth in many of these countries to the point where some democracies are bordering on plutocracies. Then there is the despair felt by ordinary citizens who don't believe that their representatives are doing anything to ameliorate this trend. They are often right. Add to these variables the xenophobic fear of immigrants that are members of other religious groups or nationalities, the barbarians at the gates who are coming to undermine their values and their beliefs. There is also the feeling among many, among, again among the predominantly poorly educated, that their status in society is being eroded by others who are jumping ahead of them in the queue, waiting to climb the ladder of social mobility. The political gains that the authoritarians make because of some of these factors gets combined in a recipe that instructs these leaders on how to secure power by spreading fictions, fear, and finally through attacks on intellectuals and their hosts, the universities. The critics have to be taken care of. That is when academic freedom comes under fire. It is our job to be watchful and whenever and wherever we can to correct the record, find mechanisms to educate the people to think more critically, educate them with facts rather than fictions, and persuade them that their welfare is dependent to a significant degree on both advanced education and the discoveries that are born at our great universities. This is no easy task, but it is our crucial assignment. Thank you. Uh, if I were a Japanese speaker, I would have started with a long apology. If I were German, I would have started with long definitions. <laughs> if I were American, I would have started with a joke. I'm Turkish. It's customary for Turks to start out with long thank you notes, which last for about five minutes or so. I'm not going to do it. <coughs> I would like to thank, however, the chair and the director of the Center for European Studies, and also Elaine Papulias to get me engaged in this. I will focus mainly on what is written up there, academic freedoms and autonomy, under conditions of post-truth politics of a special, special kind. Mind you that we're talking about uh, politicians playing around with facts. That's nothing new, let me tell you. I mean, it's been part and parcel of politics, politicians lie. This is not a matter of fact. Uh, it's a well-established fact. And we know that. They know it as well. In fact, at the time of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, a book was written by a third lieutenant who served as um, aide de corps for the Ottoman Pasha in charge of the Ottoman armies in the middle, what was to be the Middle East. The, uh, the title of the book is uh, Zeytinda in Turkish, Jebel Zeytun in uh, Jerusalem. Falih Rufka Atay in the beginning narrates a story of a woman in Adana who runs at the trains asking for his son, Ahmed. Have you seen my Ahmed? He says. Have you seen my Ahmed? Nobody has seen him. Ahmed. He says, her Ahmed died as machine gun fodder because of a lie. And it is not a shame to lie in Eastern civilizations. So lie has been around for a long time. We're looking at a different kind of lie. Our politicians, 
and the media industry has outdone themselves now. They have created a completely different kind of a lie or a, a, a different kind of um, communication about publicly known facts. You ignore them completely. In fact, in the Daily Telegraph in the UK, Michael Deacon wrote that facts are negative. Facts are pessimistic. Facts are unpatriotic. Ignore them. B, uh, about facts. Completely bypass them. And in a sense, anybody who talks about the facts, especially makes rebuttals about the facts, the opposition, present them as smear campaigns and accuse them of scaremongering. And if necessary, declare them as, a, as enemy of the people, of the nation, and being unpatriotic. So we are into a new kind of managing perceptions. In an era, I should add to the long list that Jonathan Cole drew up as a cause in which trust in any kind of public authority has evaporated. We don't have any authority in which, in general, people trust any longer as the truth sayers of society, including experts and academics. And as you know, again, a British politician said it very clearly, we've had enough of the experts. So we're not going to be listened to. So we have a tough job, even in Germany and elsewhere. Now, I'm going to narrate to you a very specific example to which Jonathan Cole touched the Turkish case, wearing another hat that the chair had not mentioned in my introduction. I'm a member of the Science Academy, Turkey. And we write reports on academic freedoms and autonomy in the country for the last three years. And this is about the last report. And I will stick to it as much as I can. Um, because of brevity, and also because I would like to be uh, very clear about the message that I narrate. It's not only my message, it's the message of the Science Academy of Turkey on the situation that, that exists. First of all, I would like you to bring up to your attention that there was a coup attempt on the 15th of July 2016, which was a sordid attempt. Nothing good would have come out of it. And that has created a very dysfunctional influence on the politics of the country. Uh, and it has undermined uh, the um, previous standards of rule of law and the previous standards of democratization in the country. And that seems to be um, the basic problem that Turkey is facing now. First, I'd like to present the legal context in which the country operates. Uh, if you read the Turkish constitution, it's, it is a constitutional democracy. And um, it also operates under the covenant on civil and political rights of the UN, UN Declaration of Human Rights, and also European Convention of Human Rights. Um, and um, public authorities um, are in a position to protect freedom in science and arts according to these covenants and according to the Turkish constitution. In fact, even under emergency rule, by the way, what Turkey has is, I've written that in Turkish, is an extraordinary rule, not emergency rule. Emergency rule in Turkish would be translated differently. Agil durum yönetimi, for example, in Turkish. This is extraordinary. We're not in normal politics. We're out of normal politics. And even under those circumstances, two articles of the Constitution, Article 15 and 19, stipulate that all authorities are limited primarily with their obligations arising from international law, primarily, which is the previous bullet point, the covenant on civil and political rights and the European Convention of Human Rights and the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights, which is suspended for the time being because of the <laughs> extraordinary conditions Turkey is operating under. And also, again, Article 27 of the Constitution stipulates very clearly that everyone has the right to study and teach, express, and disseminate science and the arts and to carry out research in these fields freely. And this is to be guaranteed even under these circumstances by the government. <clears throat> so um, in the 2016-2017 academic year, there have been 
various violations which have been concerned publicly and um, debated publicly. And there have been various expressions by the international institutions of science on this matter, especially the autonomy of the universities had been at risk. And it looks as if it's almost, almost completely evaporate, evaporated. Now, we made some presumptions at the very beginning of our report. Therefore, I'll simply go over them. There are five of them. I'll put all of them together so, so that you can read them. Um, presumption of innocence of individuals, acts that constitute legal offenses in the academic institutions should obviously be investigated by legal authorities operating within the law. The method to control wrong practices should be provided in academic procedures, and academic institutions should be able to deal with them. Uh, then um, there should be uh, procedures whereby universities and academics make their own decisions. Um, and if they are blocked, of course, under these circumstances, the very creativity of the job um, of um, academic production will be stifled, basically. And therefore, we have to pay much more attention to that. And if that happens, the society pays a big price. These are the basic um, points that we have started out with. Now, Turkey started to be ruled by decrees uh, with the force of law, which was extended as a um, certain um, amenity to the executive branch of the government by the legislature. Therefore, it has some legislative background. And many have been promulgated over this period. With those, 5,644 academics were removed from office. If we include those 15 university uh, that were closed down and their um, members ejected, the total number reaches to 7,800 academics. There are roughly about um, 79,000 academics, so about 10%. Within an now these were um, done without any administrative procedures being followed. Total disregard for presumption of innocence. There was no investigation about these people. And they were not only dismissed from the academy, but they were uh, inhibited from um, continuing with their contributions to scientific knowledge under any circumstances. Now, most typically about them are two different kinds of freedom issues. One, what we may call, and this is my terminology, extramural discourse of an academic. What an academic speaks about not as a result of one's own research and producing critical thinking, et cetera, but as a citizen, mainly, perhaps knowing a little better certain aspects of a social or natural phenomenon than this standard individual or men or women in the street. Um, now, about 1,100 academics signed a petition known as the Academics for Peace in January 2016. And these people uh, had various disciplinary proceedings against them illegally uh, in the beginning. And there are some legal ca cases um, still continuing right now. At the time, there was no changes in the academic procedures or the laws. Therefore, what they seem to have perpetrated is their extramural discourse as any academic in which they were supposed to be free. And indeed, the constitutional court in this decision that they had made on April 16, 2015, a little earlier, argued that uh, opinions may be considered not nice by public authorities. They may be um, somewhat painful to listen to. Uh, they may dislike it. They may be offended. But uh, a part of the society may feel the same. But this does not necessarily mean that they have not to be, they had to be suppressed unless they promote use of violence, justify terrorist action, support the formation of hatred. So they had to be charged as terrorists. So with the decrees of the force of law issued after July 15, 2016, they have been claimed to be in relation with the, the sordid coup or coup attempt and receive some sanctions um, with all other coup attempters. So treating some of the individuals who had used their right to democratic opposition in the same level with organizations intended to destroy the constitutional order 
unfortunately weakens the struggle against terrorist organizations and lessens its cogency, makes it murky, and people have uh, great difficulty sorting out uh, what's going on under these circumstances. The trial process is still going on. No final judgments, to the best of my knowledge, have been passed for anybody. No state law pursues sanctions as harsh as dismissal from civil service, still, or a ban on the use of their titles, that, that that ban is imposed upon them, or a protection that the individual shall never be employed in civil service again. Some of them are at the age of 20, 22, 23, 24, long life, no service, civil service. And I'm not so sure private service can hire them either under those circumstances. And those who have gained their uh, right for pension, um, they were removed from pensioner rights or they were banned from getting them. Or a, a travel, and furthermore, a travel ban was imposed upon them. Their passports were confiscated so they couldn't go elsewhere to practice their profession either. So very harsh. They were sort of let to die in a sense. So under these circumstances, we believe as Academy of Science that this kind of punishment is too harsh to be uh, considered as such. Now the um, decree with the force of law, number 676, Article 4, which is still in place, uh, argued that if any person who is evaluated to have membership to or association or contact, irtibat in Turkish, and what is irtibat? What is contact? Living in the same apartment building is contact. If somebody calls your phone and you don't answer, that is contact, according to the Turkish prosecutors. Um, greeting someone in the streets is a contact. If you have contact with terrorist organizations or any structure, formation, or group that the National Security Council, which is executive branch of the government, which operates under the um, sort of new rules of the game, where the executive has a very large say, if that decides th uh, that there is uh, a terror organization um, in the country in the form of a group, that becomes a terror organization, not only for the executive branch of the government, but also judiciary. And any person in that position can be removed from civil service by the suggestion of the president of the Council of Higher Education, to which all universities are administratively connected, and by the decision of the Council of Higher Education. Executive, again, decision. On what grounds, nobody knows. Which we believe, as the academia and the uh, Science Academy, that all academicians operating in Turkey are under the risk and pressure of possibility of losing their jobs upon being evaluated to have such a contact such a loose concept to be used against them if they want to be um, shut up. This is from the Human Rights Commissioner of the European Council's report on February 15, 2017, in which there are certain allegations ma made. Some changes have occurred in them. Now, um, academics can leave the country after 15th of November next week without taking any approval from, the, from their universities. So there's a little bit of relaxation. But all these were, mis were dismissed. Some were reappointed, some were not. On what grounds, we again do not know. Uh, the autonomy of the universities was severely curtailed, as I'll mention to you in the following slides. And the commissioner considered that there was a severe blow to freedom of expression, also academic freedom, uh, as underlined by the European Court of Human Rights and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Uh, so under these circumstances, both the autonomy and freedom seems to be impaired. Now, um, there is another aspect of academics' life and the products of that that, again, occurs in the form of discourse, and I call that intramural discourse. Um, that discourse that comes out of your own academic work. Uh, as you write, you know, reviews, uh, research articles, <laughs> books, etc. That is your inter intramural discourse. Now, in this regard, the definitions provided by uh, the uh, Universities Law Act Number 2547, Article 53 was amended in the following fashion. I won't read all of them to you, but you can see the kind of lax formulation in these definitions. 
engaging in or supporting separatist or terrorist actions. What are they? In the past, a group of students writing on a, on a wall that they want education that is free, free education. That was considered as a terrorist action because the same had been argued by the PKK, a terrorist organization, definitely. So having repeated that, they were committing a crime of supporting terrorist action. So the kind of interpretations of these are going to be also a big, big problem. And this creates a severe a limitation or delimitation of intramural discourse, what you can produce in the form of your scientific writing. Not only the ethical standards, not only the methodological standards, not only logic and honesty in data collection, et cetera, is something that you have to worry about, but you have to worry about these when you publish an article. And you can be easily charged with doing any one of those in your articles, propagating terror for that matter. And these are in direct conflict, we believe, in the, with the 1997 UNESCO's recommendations concerning the status of higher education teaching personnel. And Turkey is a signatory to that and ratified it. Therefore, they should, the government should be bound by it under these circumstances, we believe. Now, autonomy eventually was completely demolished uh, by abolishing the election of rectors of the universities by their faculty. Instead, uh, appointment by the suggestion of the Higher Educational Council of three candidates, from which the president of the country selects one. If, the pre if this selection does not occur within one month, then the Higher Educational Council can provide another three names in two weeks. If they don't do that, the president of the country appoints a person as he likes. In practice, it's appointment by the president of the country. That's how it works. Now, why did we change this? In the law that was suggested, the rationale was argued by none other than Justice and Development Party, party that argues that they represent what the French call volonté générale, or the national will. They argued that elections of university presidents lead to unfair practices, chagrin, and strife in the universities and create a chaotic atmosphere in institutions of tertiary education. The replacement of election system with an appointment system would eliminate these problems at the universities. Is it only the best educated in Turkey who are unable to rule themselves democratically? The less educated are in a better shape in electing Justice and Development Party to rule what kind of a logic is this? This is a party that argues that it's in government by the authorization of the people. Thanks to elections, they exist. And they argue that elections cause unfair practices, chagrin, strife, chaos. Lovely. And as a result of which, the first rector to be appointed by the president of the country was the rector of Boazici University a former Robert College established in 1863 as the first US college outside the US territories in the world, then turned over to the Turkish state in 1971 to become a state university. It had started the practice of electing the presidents for the first time in 1992. And this is uh, getting even with them in the minds of these people. And there are, um, I would admit, many universities in which there were many ill practices in the election of, of the rectors. None of them were considered for appointment by the president of the country before this university, which has had many elections of presidents without any problems. So uh, the, the record stands as such. So um, research and educational matters that are to be decided by the universities were removed from their own jurisprudence to the Higher Educational Council, which is not a university. And I'm not so sure whether they're capable of managing anything uh, that academics do. So in conclusion, it is very obvious to us, Science Academy, that academic staff is viewed by the government 
as potential criminals whose intramural rights and liberties should never be left too broad. These people can only be controlled through a regime stricter than the one that is applied to the public bureaucrats under the thumb of the government itself. So the rules that are imposed upon the academia are much more stricter than those imposed upon civil servants under these circumstances. And instead of research and evaluation of the university's own organs to find a suitable rector in line with his own methods and traditions, the rector is appointed externally upon the discretion of the central governance. The university loses its autonomy and becomes part of a hierarchical order, which it is not. Today, university is considered in the Turkish political regime as just one state agency, just like any other bureau, in a pecking order that starts with the president of the country, prime minister, uh, and the cabinet, and legislature, et cetera. There's a pecking order, and you find yourself in that pecking order, and are supposed to act as part of that hierarchy. That leaves no room for any of the following. I'll put them simply uh, down here and not go any further and, and finish up here. Um, remove merit, academic ethic as the guides, freedom and in integrity as the essential principles in conducting research and education. And under those circumstances, uh, the most specialized, qualified labor force of the country, uh, the government expects to be brought up with the culture of doing not one's its job properly and honestly, not using one's own reason and will, not sticking with academic ethics, but government diktat. And no government control is going to create this kind of product, is what we believe in. Um, so under these circumstances, we don't believe that there is any evidence that centralism for all is the answer to the existing problems of the academic institutions, whatever that they might have been. And there is no guarantee that central political authority acts with academic merit in mind and not partisanship under these circumstances. And when you remove merit, all sorts of ill come out of it. And most of the problems that Turkish academics and academics elsewhere suffer is when you uh, change your compass from merit to something else. Thank you very much. Good morning. Oops. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, I can't resist one observation. I was asked to keep my remarks within 10 minutes, and I will do so. Um, and I, my plan is to make some brief um, observations on the points of post-truth, populism, academic freedom, but within the uh, uh, some British with a, an eye to the British perspective. Um, on post-truth, first, as, as you may know, uh, Oxford University Press named post-truth the word of the year this past year. Um, and this poses a real problem for universities. Uh, we see our role as being the pursuit of truth. We see truth as an aspiration rather than a possession. So if we've gone beyond it, when we haven't yet uh, achieved it. it. It truly is a problem, I think. The notion is that, um, or as OUP interprets uh, post-truth, it's that emotion, not evidence, matters. And this would seem to be vindicated um, in some of the voting patterns around the uh, American presidential election, as well, of course, as the Brexit vote. Um, for example, um, by a margin of 69 to 12, as uh, Trump voters believed that the women who made accusations against President Trump were doing so to hurt the campaign. They were lying to hurt the campaign. Uh, Clinton supporters, on the other hand, believed these women by a margin of 83 to 7. So that's an extraordinary dichotomy. So we see inconvenient facts being dismissed as, as fake news, um, as most famously on the whole issue of the, the size of the crowds at um, inauguration and so on. But I've been struck by what I see as a difference between the role of the media, both here and in Britain. Here, the more President Trump tends to criticize the media, the more the reputation of the media seems to rise amongst opponents of President Trump. Uh, I think there's a very different pattern happening in the UK. Um, historically, in the UK, the media, the pr print media, has been divided between the tabloids and the broadsheets, and there's been 
uh, a very significant difference in approach between the two. Uh, the Daily Mail is arguably one of the most powerful institutions in, in Britain today. Um, but I see recently uh, an erosion of this distinction, uh, particularly some of the broadsheets like The Times and The Telegraph, I think are becoming increasingly similar to the tabloids um, in pursuing a, a very clear uh, political objective and slanting what they cover to advance it. Again, this poses a real problem, I think. Um, and then we have the role of technology uh, and, of course, the introduction of bots and the, um, the difficulty of interpreting the value of any information we see. On populism, here I'm influenced by the work of, of Cass Mudd, of Jan Muller and John Jordis in, in understanding this um, emergence of populism, though, as Jordis has pointed out, it has um, been around at least since the 1890s in this country. But the essential notion is this dichotomy between the real people and the elite. Um, and the, the difference is one of values more than income. I mean, President Trump, for example, we don't quite know how wealthy he is, but he's not poor. So it's not a, a simple division of, between rich and poor. This was captured by Nigel Farage in the UK when he declared the Brexit vote to be a victory for the real people as though the 48% who voted against Brexit were not real people. Um, it's, historically, universities have tended to be at the vanguard of social movements. This was emphatically the case in the 60s and 70s. But this is not the case today. Now we're seen as part of the problem, part of the plutocracy. And this is quite striking when you look at the demographic of the voting patterns in the, both the presidential election and the vote for Brexit. The biggest single predictor um, of how somebody voted in both cases was um, educational level. Um, in the UK, a quarter of university graduates voted to leave, whereas three quarters of those with no post-secondary qualifications voted to leave. Similarly, 75% of white people with no college degree voted for Donald Trump. Uh, there was a headline in the Atlantic magazine which captured this saying, America's educational divide put Trump in the White House. So even controlling for race and income, the concentration of college degrees was the strongest indicator of whether or not a county voted for Trump. Education level mattered more than anything else, even when controlling for economic factors. More college graduates in a county hurt Trump's vote more than having a large Asian population, more than having a larger Hispanic population, more than having a larger black population. Now, education could, of course, be a proxy for economic factors, but the education gap persisted even when controlling for a country's, a county's median income, its industrial base, and whether it had lost manufacturing jobs. Now, while working class males have long been the base of um, Trump's support, money and race did not decide the election. Education level did. And similar patterns applied in the British referendum. As I said, those with postgraduate qualifications voted 75-25 for Remain. Those who left school without qualifications voted 73-20 seven for leave. Class and age mattered, but education mattered more. In general, areas with older and poorer voters tended towards leave, while those with more immigration and more college educated tended to remain. But by far the strongest indicator was education. I think this is a new phenomenon, and it's certainly a troubling one. I see it as having real pretentious impact um, or pretentious ramifications for universities in the future. It's the potential to undermine the really the very bonds that hold representative democracy together, these bonds rely on trust and assume certain shared values like respect for knowledge. But if knowledge is perceived simply as a perk of the plutocracy, the underlying consensus that the basis of trust on which decisions are made could be, could be eroded. Um, we saw in the referendum, and it's been alluded to already, um, the growth of disdain for experts, most famously captured by somebody educated at my university, I'm sorry, saying that we've had enough of experts. Um, or as one uh, person who called into the Radio 4 Today program said, after all, experts built the Titanic. Um, of course, in Belfast, they say it was fine when, they, when it left here. Um, but <laughs> I, academics are more trusted still 
than politicians, even though that trust has eroded. The most recent Edelman poll gives me some grounds for hope. It says um, people trust academics 60%, CEOs 37%, and government officials by 29%. But when we turn to, to academic freedom, certainly the situation in Britain uh, pales in comparison to the situations we've heard about in Hungary, in Turkey, and in Russia. Um, but on the other hand, it's, um, we're, universities are under significant threat, um, and the academic freedom of universities is under significant threat. I, I'm sure many of you are, may have heard or may not. About three weeks ago, I received a letter from a government whip asking me for a list of all the people who were teaching courses on Brexit, a copy of their lecture notes, and links to their course websites. Uh, this was somewhat chilling, and it's uh, pretty clear what the intent behind it was. Fortunately, um, the reaction was a very powerful one, um, and um, he, he didn't get his list. Um, but in this age of populism, universities have become a target. As you know, British politics at the moment are, are febrile in the extreme. Um, and uh, the Labour Party won uh, the youth vote by a landslide in the last election um, in, this, in, in the summer, not least because they promised to make all university free and to introduce maintenance grants. There was no indication of how this 11.2 billion pounds would be funded, but that didn't matter. Um, but the result is that uh, politicization of university fees. Um, so there has been um, quite a concerted move to blame universities for these fees. Uh, so in the press over the past several months, there's been unrelenting attack on universities, particularly on vice chancellors and, our, and, our, and on our obscene salaries. Um, it is alleged that, we, uh, that vice chancellors are using the fees to increase their own salaries. Now, there's no basis in fact for this. The fees were introduced to, um, um, to replace government funding um, in an entirely legitimate move. But because it's become so unpopular, universities are being blamed. Um, we're seeing increasing levels of legislation um, in Britain. We have, as you probably are familiar with, the Research Excellence Framework, but this has now been followed by the Teaching Excellence Framework. Uh, without anybody noticing the irony of, of um, evaluating the ability to teach nuance with a gold, silver, and bronze star, um, which is how universities are, are ranked in the teaching excellence framework. Um, since then, that was last year's innovation. This year now, so we have the REF, the TEF, and now this year we have the KEF, which is the knowledge exchange framework. We've dropped the aspiration for excellence. And none of these are to be confused with the KISS, which is the key information sets. Um, so we've had a recent higher education bill, which is going through Parliament, which creates a new regulatory body for, for universities called the Office for Students. The remit of this office in, uh, is couched in the language of students or consumers. Uh, universities will be required to have contracts with their consumers, with their customers, and uh, to guarantee value for money. Um, pay over 150,000 pounds a year will have to be justified and uh, cross subsidization across uh, will not be allowed. Uh, so we fear this may bring in differential fees for different subjects, again, all in an effort to ensure value for money. Uh, grade inflation, there's also talk of legislation on grade inflation. Um, there has on the, on the upside been a, a recent discovery by the Minister for Education of the importance of freedom of speech. Because the right-wing press has been very critical of what they see as a snowflake generation demanding uh, protection from offence, the government has now come out very much in favour of freedom of speech. Um, it hasn't been tested how this commitment to freedom of speech would be reconciled with last year's prevent legislation, which requires universities, gives us a statutory duty to prevent the expression of extremist speech on campus. Um, so we're, we're, we're getting significant... Um, challenges externally on academic freedom, but we also have internal challenges. Academics increasingly are exercising, I think, self-censorship. Self uh, nobody wants to put their head above the parapet and be pilloried in the press. Um, uh, we're not adequately, I think, standing up to students who demand a right not to be offended. Um, and we're not reminding people, not reminding our students or indeed the public of what Tacitus said, which is that truth requires inspection and delay. 
A falsehood requires haste and uncertainty. So in the age of social media, um, we are, and immediate judgment by 24-hour uh, press, we are moving very far away from inspection and delay. So what is to be done? I think the public, and I hear my recommendations coincide very much with Jonathan's, the public needs to know why academic freedom is important. We shouldn't simply take it for granted that it is. Uh, we need to persuade them. We need to pre present evidence on the link between academic quality and academic autonomy. We cannot assume that our value to society is obvious. We must make the case for our cultural, economic, and societal impact. We must make the case for curiosity-driven research. And we must ensure that the public appreciates um, the contributions we make, whether it's to curing disease or uh, advancing the economy. Um, and we must practice our principles by welcoming all legal speech onto our universities, especially speech with which we disagree. I think we must be seen to be fair in our admissions and transparent in our governance. We must educate our students to tell the difference between evidence and opinion, between information and knowledge, and even wisdom, and through them to export these values to society broadly. We must be advocates for others as well as for ourselves, so not turning inward and looking at our own difficulties, but um, be prepared to be generous in how we spend our time advocating. Um, and I think we must be willing to be objective ar arbiters of disputed public issues, whether it's climate change or anything else. The reality is we have benefited enormously from globalization. We enjoyed immigration. We enjoyed it because of the intellectual contributions to our, our, our universities, the cultural contributions to our communities. We benefited from the, from the economic advantages of, of the f cheap labor that immigration allowed. Um, so we've been beneficiaries. We have a responsibility, I think, now to defend globalization. Um, and for much of our history, we have been guardians of knowledge. We've seen our responsibility to add to the sum of knowledge, to be guardians of that knowledge. But now I think we have to do more. We have to become advocates for knowledge. Um, because I think advocates, free and independent inquiry and evidence needs advocates more than ever before. Thank you. You know, I have to say that I find this a little bit chilling as a, someone who was educated at the communist university that we are revisiting um, all those issues again in the 21st century. Um, we have very little time, uh, so let me open the floor for uh, questions. And, um, and if you could please introduce yourself and, and keep the comments to the minimum so we can uh, we can have a number of, of questions. Uh, yes, please. Thank you all for, my name is Iolus, I'm a visiting researcher here at CBS. Thank you all for this very rich uh, panel. I have a question for the entire panel and a specific question for Lisa. Uh, so I was also wondering, what is the long, what in your view, what's going to be the long-term effect of the suppression of academic freedom? Because we are talking about short-term and what's happening at the moment, but this is going to have an impact some of these uh, problems and challenges. And for you, to, I really commend your suggestion that you know we should reach out to the public more. But the trend in academia is exactly the opposite. We are pushed for producing impact, high impact factor journal, publishing there. And then most of my colleagues are not even teaching, or they don't want to even teach, because we have to publish to get jobs. So what would you recommend to get over this cycle? Thank you. I saw the hands over there. Yes, um, yeah, again, thank you very much for the very interesting <coughs> um, talks. And um, I'm Katja Möhring from Mannheim University and currently a visiting fellow here. And I also want to address the whole panel, but it was raised by, by Jutta Almina, <coughs> uh, the point that um, all active people working in academia have a certain arrogance towards the general public. And this might also be related in, to some degree to the fact that uh, academia, especially in social science, is a very homogeneous group. So we don't have people from low-income families, for example, among our students very much. So what do you think could be done to change this situation that we ourselves become a more heterogeneous group? OK, please. Me? Ah, thank you. Uh, my name is Dimitris Kerilis. I'm a professor in uh, Athens, university professor. And uh, 
regular TV commentator, so this is very close to my heart this afternoon that we are talking about. And my question goes to the international regimes and institutions. Europe is very institutionalized, we know that. But apparently there has been tremendous weakness. For example, uh, we have the Council of Europe. Uh, great democracies are part of the Council, like Azerbaijan, uh, Russia, uh, now Turkey. Uh, the Council has proved uh, completely useless and incompetent in sanctioning uh, what is its mission, the defense of the rule of law, democracy, and human rights. And then obviously we have NATO, which has recently admitted the great Republic of Montenegro in its midst uh, from, last I checked, uh, Montenegro did not have a change of government since 1989, and the government that it has is a continuation the old Yugoslavia. So that's how great democracy were works. And obviously EU, Hungary is a member of the European uh, Union. If this can happen within the EU, uh, this is very disconcerting. So I would like to have a comment about the role of all these great uh, organizations that we have put in place in Europe since the Second World War and apparently are not very effective. We have space for one more question, please. Just to respond, and this is more to Dr. Cole than, than the others on the panel. Um, we heard this terrible of what goes on in Hungary, and especially in Turkey, where outside forces are doing it to the university. My concern is what the universities are doing themselves in the creation at Harvard, at Columbia, in contrast with Chicago, of the safe spaces, the warning, the, uh, the non-invitation to certain uh, controversial speakers. Uh, it used to say when American sneezes, Europe gets a cold. It's almost the other way around now. Europe has a cold and it is reporting it here. Thank you very much. Let me uh, come back to the panels, uh, uh, to the panel, and maybe we'll start in the same order. Uh, so, Yuta, please. So, thank you very much for this question. Um, I think uh, that uh, in other areas, but then it was on the entire time. What? Okay, fine. <laughs> I thought it's just the other way around in Germany. I mean, sometimes things are going differently. So. Uh, uh, thanks for this question. So I, I think um, we had in, indeed made some progress. Like the German uh, National Science Foundation said, we are not interested in your entire publication list anymore. We want to have the three most important publications. We have more made progress in terms of parentships. Uh, so we are saying, well, if you are a young mother or a young father, we ask less from you. So we take this into account. We also had huge troubles in, in good performance in teaching in Germany. We made some progress in this area as well. And we say, well, you can't get any professorship without having shown your ability to teach. So why can't we uh, also introduce as one of several indicators to cherish public outreach and uh, to take meta training, for example, seriously, and have it uh, as one part in the educational uh, instructions? I mean, this is quite simple, actually, but we have to do it. And I do not see that, uh, in particular, uh, university administration uh, is going forward to this. Uh, and it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's about rules. It's about rules we all have to, to agree on, and then we have to uh, introduce those rules. So it's not impossible, but uh, we simply lag behind. And therefore, this entire talk about, oh, we must be more on media and things like this, I think it's... it's <coughs> Well, let me let me just follow on. Um, and since I probably took up more than the time I was supposed to, I'll be try to be very very brief uh, about this. But I just want to put this in historical perspective. I mean, this this may be an extreme case in certain areas, but look what happened in 1933 in Germany um, with the purging of uh, of the universities and intellectuals, and what happened in the United States in 1920 in the early 1920s after. The aliens and the uh, and, and the sedition acts were uh, imposed. What happened during the McCarthy period? What has what happened during the Vietnam War? I mean, these are all times when academic freedom and universities came under attack, when intellectuals became under attack, 
when there was a sense of arrogance of intellectuals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they, it passed. Um, fortunately, in some places, the question really is, do you have the institutional, other institutions, to allow you to ultimately overcome uh, these kinds of uh, attacks? And are the universities, have, do they have the courage, like Robert Hutchins did, to stand up to uh, these kinds of attacks? What I think is different is exactly what you pointed out in your question, and that is that Students were always, in some ways, uh, wanted expansion of, uh, of, of the domain of freedom of speech and freedom of expression and, and support for, the, for diverse views. And for the, um, at least the first time in my memory, we have at elite uh, universities, or let us say highly selective universities, uh, we have students who are moving in the other direction, who are concerned about um, whether or not free speech has been expanded too much, whether academic freedom has been ex overly expanded. And in my view, this is exactly the teaching moment when the leaders of these universities, like Robert Zimmer at Chicago today, should be speaking out publicly and introducing first year students to what a university is about and why it is that we will have people to this campus that, whose views you find opprobrious. And not doing that, in the absence of that, it is essentially ducking your head in the sand, in, into the sand, not wanting to confront these issues, not wanting to defend academic freedom, and, and, and not just defending it, but describing why it's so important and very few people are willing to do this. And, you know, it, you know, academics is not known for its courage. Uh, it, it has many other wonderful, wonderful attributes, but I can't say that all of its leaders and all of its faculty are known for their courageous stances on these kinds of things. And that's somewhat unfortunate. Now, the issue, and, I'm, and I'll stop, issue of how to get to the public and the role of, the, role of uh, the public intellectual versus the scholar, that has been around a long time as well. In the 1950s, the 1960s, this was also uh, much, uh, much debated. Um, but the question is whether or not we can do it well. I mean, when the public intellectuals were talking, they, and they do, as they do today on occasion, they were all talking to ourselves. We haven't mounted the kinds of of educational campaigns to the broader public, which respects the broader public and the issues that they face, and try to describe what a university is truly about and why it is important to defend them. We simply haven't uh, created the kind of vocabulary and the kind of messaging that is necessary to do that. And uh, I think this is a terrible mistake. It has to do with the sense that any time you, you drift away from your insular um, uh, disciplinary uh, outlets, you are prostituting yourself. It's a form of intellectual prostitution. It's not. We have to begin to do this in a serious way, the way hospitals are beginning to do this in very effective ways. So on the one hand, I don't think what we're experiencing is altogether new by any stretch of the imagination. But I do think that we have to think about different mechanisms and new mechanisms to deal with the current situation so that we perhaps can reverse some of the trends or halt the trends that we're seeing, especially uh, as described in places like Turkey and Hungary and Poland. Thank you, Jonathan. Everything, please. Uh, Long-term uh, effects of um, threats and erosion of academic freedom. It's very easy to talk about long term. Since I'll be dead, I can tell anything, you know, basically. It doesn't make any difference. Um, we're not good at forecasting, to tell you the truth. Um, not in social sciences. Kenneth Galbraith has a famous um, sentence on this. I'll reiterate. Uh, I, and sorry for the uh, economists. He said the only reason why there is economic forecast is to make, to render astrology reputable. So under these circumstances, I will not make any kind of argument for long-term influence, but if this goes on, you can look at examples of similar developments that have occurred. For example, those of you who would be interested in this sort of thing may look at the Economist um, Christmas issue where they have a nice report on Austria what Austria was like 100 years ago, 
what Austria is like today. The difference is fascism. Social science is gone. Most of the sciences are gone, never to come back again. That's the risk that all these societies, Hungary, Turkey, Poland, and others are face to face with. Other sciences, they need them. Uh, they savor them. Uh, natural sciences, and it, indeed, they are not so acerbically uh, predisposed towards them, uh, in essence. But social sciences, especially uh, law included, although it's a normative science, uh, they will be decimated, uh, never to come back again in the next generation or, or, or two. That's my um, dismal perspective on, on these sorts of things. We're not arrogant. I'm, I'm sorry, we're not. We, we, we talk a jargon, which is technically catered for our purposes because we have to come up with concepts that mean the same thing to all of us, all our community. And that is very, very difficult to communicate. I have been speaking on Turkish television networks, also on CNN International and others. I don't think there was any difficulty of me to be heard about these matters. Um, but the average person who listens to you does not have a university degree. So that, that seems to be the most important problem. How do you uh, speak and communicate uh, these rather difficult concepts? You know, um, it may be about physics or chemistry or uh, political science or some other, uh, or economics, you know, liquidity trap. Uh, very easily to people in the next two minutes as the uh, anchor keeps on saying, hurry up, hurry up, we don't have any time. You can't do it. So if it shows us arrogance, it's not. We have this kind of problem uh, of, of communication. You can communicate certain uh, matters more effectively, of course, but it's not only a matter of um, communication. The media is trying to, um, as much as possible, forestall any kind of meaningful communication. Uh, Krugman wrote this in, a, in an article in the New York Times, uh, this post-truth politics, which now uh, pits an expert on, say, climate change from MIT, a physicist who worked on this topic for 30 years, against someone with no credentials from, say, Arkansas. And they sit together. Both are presented as experts. And they turn to the MIT professor, what is your point about climate change? He talks about five minutes. And then he turns to the other expert and says, what is your point? He says, this is all rubbish. You know, it's not what's happening. And then he says, wait a minute, et cetera. They got into some kind of a debate. And the anchor says, well, as you can see, they have split opinion on this matter. What am I supposed to understand from all of this <laughs> in the end? So media is doing everything in its power to confuse the average um, listener or viewer. Of, of all of these. So far as your criticisms of Council of Europe, EU, NATO, well taken from a point of virtue. But we live in a world where not only values, but interests matter. There's a lot of interest in these. And that's why these interest relationships keep these institutions going the way they are going. And, the, and these interests cannot be ditched. And then you cannot simply act on values uh, in international politics, I'm afraid, for the um, our past record is against this. I'm, I'm sure we're not going to see any change in that. Uh, so they'll be, you know, in this murky state of existence for a while, for a while uh, to come. Um, universities are doing to themselves. Yeah, that's true. I mean, look at the dietitians. I've been trying to lose weight. You know, li listen to three, four of them. All tell you the totally irreconcilable and contradictory <laughs> thing. All of them are experts. You know, there is something there. I mean. Medical science, the same problem. Sometimes they come up with uh, one argument, you know, if you uh, eat this, you'll never die, et cetera. Then they say, well, uh, this is proven not to be the case. Our statistics was not correct. And of course, these kinds of debates are not impacting well on the, um, in general, uh, on the um, general public. And also, and uh, a point you made earlier, uh, we haven't done well when we met with real difficult problems. McCarthy era. What was the performance of the American universities in the McCarthy era? Is it something to boast about? I'm not so sure. No, you can be very sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, yeah. That's something that you have to take into perspective. And you should be. If well-instituted 
uh, powerhouses of academia, such as Harvard, cannot stand behind the decision it makes, then there's something wrong either with the decision. You should change your methods of making that decision. Or there's something wrong with the way you approach uh, the powerful. And that is, of course, more problematic. And that sets the record for all the other universities, because we use these institutions as, as examples. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, very briefly, we're, I think there's a lot of agreement here on the, the imperative of engaging uh, externally. The British government deals with this in its research excellence framework by uh, according now first 20, now 25% of your grade on your research is your impact, the impact. This is an effort to inculcate a sense of external engagement. Um, this is one area where European institutions have been useful. A, a couple of weeks ago was European Researchers Night in cities university cities all across Europe. You had tens of thousands of people engaging with the universities. In mine, we had uh, 8,000 members of the public and 600 researchers. Um, the members of the public were invited in and essentially could order an expert off a menu and engage with them for the <laughs> evening. Um, we had, as I say, we had 8,000 people sign up for it. So um, the difficulty is doing any of this at scale. Um, we have an awful, we have all kinds of impact awards to try and change the culture. Um, and I think it's imperative we do so. But our success in doing so, if I can jump to the second question, will be directly linked to our ability to solve this problem. Um, where we're seen not to be representative of, of society as a whole, where we're seen to be bastions of the privileged. Um, unless we can be seen to be fair and open to um, every member of society uh, on an equal basis, we're not going to be successful, I think, in, in persuading them of the value of what we do. Um, I, too, think that European institutions have been disappointing in, in responding particularly in in uh, to, uh, events in Hungary. And on safe spaces, um, I think they are antithetical to a university. I think a university is in and of itself a safe space. It should be safe for all legal speech. And we have to constantly tell our students that. Um, I do so on a daily basis and have the scars to show for it. Thank you. As you see, we are not into a joyful and optimistic uh, start uh, for this summer, um, but we have still five minutes uh, for coffee break. Let me uh, join me to thank our panelists for this fascinating discussion. Thank you.